My name is Jillian, and I'm host of the Blogger Genius Podcast. Before we get into today's interview, let me ask you a question. Are you wishing you could sell digital products like digital downloads or workshops, memberships, coaching, mini courses, but you don't know where to start? And are you tired of complicated tech and spending way too much money on monthly subscriptions? Well, you need a tool that makes all of this simple, and the answer is Milo Tree Cart. So this is the tool we built for non-techies who want to tap into a new income stream. With Milo Tree Cart, you get fill in the blank sales pages, checkout pages, a sales dashboard, upsells, over a hundred done for you marketing materials, and support from people who seriously care. And right now, for a limited time, we are selling Milo Tree Cart for a lifetime deal of $349. Pay once or in three easy installments and enjoy it forever. Hit pause right now. Head to MiloTree.com. We offer a 30-day no questions asked money back guarantee, so there is no risk. And if you purchase before the end of October, as a bonus, I will send you my special AI prompts to help you come up with your first digital product in minutes. So head to MiloTree.com to sign up. Welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast brought to you by MiloTree. Here's your host, Jillian Leslie. Hi friends, it is Jillian. I have a fun and very informative episode for you today. I am interviewing chef and food blogger Adam Sobel. His food blog is called Cinnamon Snail. He monetizes in a variety of ways, and one of them is by selling online cooking classes, and that's what we're going to dig deep into today. Adam shares how he got started during the pandemic, how he teaches his classes live, then sells the recordings, and he's even launched a membership that has been super successful for him. He gets into detail how he shoots his videos, how he promotes them, how he uses Facebook ads to drive traffic and signups. He even shares how much money he makes per month doing this. If you've thought about teaching one-off classes, paid workshops, memberships, this is the episode for you. So without further delay, here is my interview with the very entertaining Adam Sobel. Adam, welcome to the Blogger Genius Podcast. Thank you for having me. I have to start by saying we get on this call. We've just emailed a little bit back and forth. And I said, how's your day? And you said, super ridiculously good. And I have to say that put a smile on my face. So truly welcome. Because yes, you see, definitely see now now you're having a ridiculously good day too, dear Jillian. I love that. So Adam, you are a chef, a blogger, you sell a variety of products. Talk to me about how you got into food, what your passions are, what your history is, and where you are now. Woo! All right. I'm going to try to make it not biblical in length. Uh, I grew up living in New York City, and my folks are literary agents. So my mom was like mostly representing cookbook authors and always had chefs and cookbook authors like testing recipes in our home kitchen and doing book releases so i i met a lot of interesting chefs growing up and then uh i started working in restaurants like after i met um this girl joey who's now my wife of um many years uh when i was like in late high school she was like the first vegan person i had met and she only ate french fries and canned soup and what have you and i was like man i gotta learn how to make extraordinarily delicious food for this girl um because she's really cute and she deserves to eat something yummy so you know I, I i didn't know how to cook and i was just like copying recipes down out of cookbooks in barnes and nobles and trying all this stuff and like eventually I started making some tasty food and then I was like, man, I should start like working in restaurants just to like learn how to cook better. So I started um, working in some restaurants in New York City and um, I worked at probably like a dozen restaurants over the course of about 10 or 12 years. Um, 
during that time, I myself became a uh, vegetarian and then vegan. I, I went vegan um, actually the very day our first daughter was born, which is now 22 years ago. So anyway, I, I went vegan and, and I'd been working in a bunch of vegan restaurants. And eventually I launched my own thing in 2010. Uh, where Your own my restaurant? Wife and I, so it started as a food truck. Um, my wife and I saved up like enough money from doing some like private chefing. And we had this like little stand at our local farmer's market doing vegan prepared food. And we bought like the most beat up crappy food truck on all of Craigslist. At the time, it was like the first vegan organic food truck in the whole country. And it got a bunch of press and you know, like it took a little while, like maybe about a year. And it slowly like really picked up and went way beyond my wildest dreams of like becoming extremely popular. Um, we got a permit to run it in Manhattan. And by like 2014, it was the number one highest rated place of any kind to eat in New York City. And it was like the number four highest rated place on Yelp for the entire United States. Wow. Um, and it just got crazy. Like the amount of like the amount of opportunities that came to me because of that were wild. And um you know, like soon I found myself doing all this stuff that was not cooking because this business had grown immensely. And like, I found myself like managing this army of employees instead of like directly cooking for people, which is what I really love. Um, uh, when the pandemic hit, it was like kind of perfect timing because I really wanted to scale down and do something smaller and more local to where I live out in New Jersey. And, um, you know, I had like the first year or so of the pandemic where I was just doing a little bit of culinary consulting for other people's food businesses. Like I've always done kind of recipe development for, um, for, for other people's businesses, both restaurants and food manufacturers and what have you. And during that time, I really got to have like a little time and space to reflect on like what I really did and did not want to be doing so since that first year of the pandemic like i launched this blog within the last year or so but that was kind of like a way for me to market the online cooking classes i started doing during the pandemic like i i used to teach at culinary schools before the pandemic um but during the pandemic that was that was like a reasonable way to start making a living again uh, you know, like I set up a bunch of cameras in my home kitchen and every month as it grew, I would like kind of upgrade it and learn more about setting it up a little slicker. And the blog was kind of like an afterthought way of being like, how can I attract more traffic to my website where people will convert and like purchase cooking classes for me? So I think it's probably like the other way around to how a lot of your listeners might be thinking about it where like they have a blog and they want to monetize it by adding cooking classes to it i kind of came at it from like the totally topsy-turvy other direction how did you okay so you start this blog or you start with cooking classes how mm -hmm. did you have an audience to sell them to is it because you have a following and people know who you are who's buying yeah them? so i mean so so I have amassed a pretty loyal following, not just not just locally, but like internationally for on my food social business. media as an email through, through list. So, yeah, through mostly through social media. Um, I actually was really bad about ever having an email list. Like I only started one maybe two years ago, um, and now I like I love it. <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm I'm kind of kicking myself. I didn't have an email list like all along, but honestly the customer who purchases cooking classes for me is kind of different from the people who used to buy food for me. You know, when I announced that I was going to start like offering cooking classes, you know, some people were really psyched, but so many people were like, uh, I don't want to like learn how to cook from you. I just want you to cook for us, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. so it's kind of a different customer anyway. So honestly, I have no issue like having sort of built an email list from scratch now because 
that list is like highly engaged with people who actually want to take classes and learn cooking from me. And it's great. It's so nice. let's, let's talk. If you were to talk to the typical food blogger, she, or let's say it's a she, a lot of my audience are women and they have some sort of niche. And by the way, gluten-free is like the power niche. Um, but let's say they start, you know, they're, let's say like healing something, which is typically where somebody gets into this and they start creating content and they start posting on Pinterest and Instagram and growing their list and growing their traffic and sending newsletters. And they reach a certain point and they say, Hey, what else can I offer? And this is where we come in with my literary cart because we help food bloggers who are, by the way, one of our biggest customers, create new revenue streams. Somebody says, I want to create cooking classes. A, is that doable? B, how would you set that up? And C, how much time does this take? Okay. So the let's start with C, which is that it can take like as much or as little time as you want it to take you know like i personally i'm super lazy i don't want to spend all of my time like editing videos you know like that's why i don't have a youtube channel like i'm i'm happy to be in front of a camera i'm happy to teach cooking i like do not want to spend like two hours sitting down to like cut out every time i say um and like uh, zoom in on this thing and it's too finicky for me personally so what i do is um the kind of lazy man's approach at this which is that <laughs> i i teach my cooking classes in in one shot and then i sell it in a couple different ways so i'll talk about that afterwards what i do is i teach like a live class and so people sign um, up and pay you for the live class people sign up and pay for it um though i do also offer some like free or donation based classes sort of as like a lead magnet into my world right um and some of those are great like i'll have sometimes like 1700 people sign up for one of those and they you know most of them end up on my email list and then they end up purchasing classes for me in the future. Where are you advertising this? How are people getting, how, so, how are 1700 people showing up? So um, up until like right now, my live classes were all being sold through Eventbrite, um, okay. which has made that really, really easy. Um, you know, like it's a good system for people purchasing tickets and you can add some add-ons to them when they sign up, you know, they can like purchase previous class recordings I've done when they sign up. Now, are people um, finding you on Eventbrite? Are they going, is Eventbrite, I mean, I know what it is for right, buying so, stuff, but so like, it's where mix. are people discovering you? There, there are some people just like searching for stuff on Eventbrite, but I think the bulk of the traffic is like coming through marketing efforts that I'm doing. Are both, you doing paid uh, ads? So I did a, I do a small amount of paid ads, on, um, but most of on that Facebook, is, uh, Google, where yeah, are on 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 Facebook and Instagram. Um, for a long time, Eventbrite had a product called Eventbrite Boost that was sort of like a Facebook ads manager interface. Because I, I can't stand Facebook ad manager. I don't know about you, but every time I look at that thing, it's like upside down. They've like changed everything. And there's too many things to mess with. Like I could spend my whole day like designing an ad and it's not fun. Um, this thing was like a product where you could put in like a few different photos or videos, a few different like ad creative, like copy, you know, versions. And then a few different audiences, right? Including like sort of retargeting audiences, like, you know, people who purchased your classes in the past or people who have visited your website if you have the pixel installed. And, um, you know, those people are like a lot easier to sell to than just like a cold right. audience of people who like whatever it is kind of food that you do, right? Um, and uh so wait i know, want to stop what, you for what, one sec yeah, so eventbrite you're paying eventbrite for eventbrite boost are they then running your ads on meta on facebook and instagram or it's only right, on so, their platform so it, no it was like a interface for facebook, for ads. facebook ad manager and it okay. would just basically like throttle your budget towards whichever variant of like ad creative and audience was converting best which was like great 
like okay. that kind of made, yeah. Facebook made it ads easier. really foolproof for me. Um, Eventbrite though, like many softwares in this wild, wild world we live in, has just announced like a massive increase in their um, fees. This is the year like everything's getting expensive, you know. Wait, 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 I like... have to pause. Except my electric oh. card, except my electric card yeah. right now, because for our first thousand customers, we are selling it as a lifetime deal for 349. So we can learn from you, so we can lean into you. So, you know, we can be your biggest fans and hopefully you would, you know, I believe in karma. I believe that what you put out, you get back. So anyway, so go on. Anyhow, so so just now, like I'm in the process of transitioning completely off of Eventbrite and hosting all the classes through my own website, which like is totally what you could do with uh, my luxury car, right? Like, um, and so there's there's kind of two ways I end up monetizing my classes. One is through like people signing up for the like live streamed class that they take in real time and they can ask questions during the class. And then like, the second is kind of like selling the recordings and recipes of those classes after the fact, which is like very evergreen. I have like kind of this whole library now of all the classes I've ever taught on my website. And if somebody wants to learn vegan Thai food, there's a class for that. If they want to learn like, you know, pizza making skills, there's a class for that, right? Um, and then third is that I sell like a membership to my classes so that while somebody's enrolled in that membership, like they just get all the classes that I teach that are live and, you know, some like bonus content that I give them and stuff. And that that's really, really helpful, like in terms of making an actual living at doing these classes because is your membership, you know, the membership, because, you know, these the class is kind of like ebb and flow, um, you know, like I think a lot less people take them generally during the summer. They're, you know, they're a lot better attended, obviously, like in Q4 and in the winter and stuff. Um, and, you know, being as I do vegan food, like there's a ton of people who go vegan, like just for the new year. So I do like a big veganuary type of program a month. And having that membership, though, like kind of gives me a little bit more financial stability, whereas otherwise, like some months are great and some months are not so great. So can, um, we, can we dig into the details? One. Sure. Okay. How long are your videos? Okay. So my classes are like probably on the long side for a lot of people. Um, my normal monthly class is like a two hour long cooking class. Um, but I also tend to do like when I do a free or donation based class, usually that's like a singular topic and it might be like a 45 or 60 minute uh, class okay. on like one thing. So you are sending people either to a donation based class or a free class. And let's say you're using, you were using Facebook ads mm -hmm, to get mm -hmm. people aware of it. How much were you paying per conversion per person to come? Um, you know, so with with that, like, I always had like a positive ROI on it. I as long as like, I'm not losing money on those, I'm cool to just keep shoveling money at it. Because, you know, right. if it's not costing me anything for those people to attend. But what if it's um, a free class? Well, you know, the free classes also kind of balance out in two different ways. One is that even though like the main ticket for it is free, I'll have like, um, add-ons that people can select to kind of like give me some revenue from those classes. And for a very big audience, you know, like if you have a thousand people show up to a class and 5% of them buy some other thing, you're selling some other recording, like it ends up being not just worth the time, but it's like, now you just got a thousand people on your mail mailing mm -hmm. list. And like, you know, like it didn't take that much time of yours and it, you got some compensation for it. Um, but, you know, like when you offer something free too, like I feel like you don't have to do that much paid marketing for it to be attractive for people. Yes. Um, though, though I'll be honest, like uh, I think having a donation based class is probably like more advantageous for a lot of people who are teaching cooking classes or who are looking to monetize in other ways because you know there's a lot of people who just like seek freebies you know like 
that ends up on your mailing list and then they like leave because they don't want to actually purchase anything. And I mean, I'm, I'm happy like sharing with everybody how to cook vegan food. I have no problem. Like the more the merrier, it's great. But uh, ultimately like uh, if I'm looking to like pay my bills and stuff, even if somebody donates like a dollar to take the class, they're so much more likely to ever purchase like a full course from you in the future than somebody who just took it because it's free. I want to take a short break to say if you're listening to this episode and it is inspiring you and you say, I want to teach a class, I want to teach a workshop, but I don't exactly know on what, you must grab my worksheet on how to come up with a workshop or class idea. It'll just walk you through how to think in terms of putting something out there that people will want to purchase from you. Go to mylotree.com slash workshop idea and download it. It's one page PDF. Again, mylotree.com slash workshop idea. And now back to the show. If I want to buy that one-off class from you, I go to your website. How much do you sell those for? And tell me about how much it costs to join your membership. Okay, so um, the classes that are like live, if you want to take them like when they're being live streamed, they end up being like about $48. Um, and then if you just want to purchase like a recording of a previous class, I think it's like $28. Okay. Because, um, you know, those people don't have the same benefit of like getting to ask questions in real time. Um, and then, you know, like I, re for the people who purchase the live class, they also like get the recording of it as well. Uh, and then my membership, like I do two different variants of it. Um, I have an offer that's like, you get a few kind of popular recorded classes as a bonus. Um, and there's like a private Facebook group and then if you pay for like a monthly membership, it's like $39 a month. So it's, it's a little bit less than it would be buying them all a la carte, but those people end up like taking my class every month. Right. And then uh, to incentivize people like taking longer memberships, my annual membership, I want to say it's like $399. Um, and then I give a couple extra like bonuses. Like I think those people get like, a PDF version of my cookbook and a couple other things that I throw in um, for people who get like, cause you know, that's, that's one of the things like in figuring out like the profitability of teaching classes this way, like, um, you know, there's that, that this is going to be really nerdy. Sorry about this, but you know, there's like that ratio um, of like, the cost to ac acquire a customer versus their like lifetime value, yeah. LTV to CAC, yeah. they call yeah, it, Yeah, right? exactly. And, yes, and, and we'll go over and what these are. So, yeah. so one of the one of the things is figuring out like what is the actual like average purchasing one of your customers does with you over the course of their like relationship with you, right? You know, like. Do so wait, okay. So wait. Mm -hmm. So wait. I just want yeah. to stop for the people who don't understand. Sure, sure. Okay, your LTV, which is your lifetime customer value. If I have a membership, and I'm charging like you thirty nine dollars a month, that customer though, on average, like if I can, you can start to monitor how long somebody stays. Let's say on average, that person is staying in your membership for ten months. That customer is worth. $390 to you over the lifetime of that customer. And that is your LTV. And then typically the rule of thumb that I use is one third. I can spend one third of $490 to acquire that customer and still make a profit. And tell me your thoughts about that. And that is called your customer acquisition cost, which is your CAC. So go ahead. Yeah. Your thoughts on that? Um, so my thoughts on that are it's very like variable according to your your like business costs, you know, like and and for me, like just to be totally clear, like this is just one part of how I make a living. Right. Like I also do recipe development. I also do catering like I do like a weekly pop up thing. Um, 
And so like overall, there are various business expenses that I need to account for. And uh, so anyway, like the the percentage that you can spare of your revenue to pay to acquire a customer, right? Which is what the LTV to CAC ratio is like, how much, basically like, all right, how much could you afford to pay for Facebook ads to get you a customer if you know your average customer is going to bring in this much revenue, right? And that just depends a lot on you, you know, like the thing about digital courses um and ebooks and all this stuff that i think people overlook is there's this sense of like oh you just create it so it's free like it doesn't cost you anything to make it but like dude i spent like ten thousand dollars or so on like cameras and lighting and microphones and you know like i like maybe not quite that yeah probably about that much honestly and um you know, every class you have to pay for the ingredients you use in those classes, um, et cetera. And, you know, there's like fees for different softwares you might use in your world, whether it's, you know, like doing these live stream classes, just as an example, uh, I do the actual live streaming of it happens through Zoom, right? And if you have like a Zoom account that has more than 100 people taking a class on it, like there's a monthly fee for that. And so all these costs have to be accounted for. So that exact ratio of it being like one third, I think it's, I think that's like a, a very general rule. A lot of people selling like um, products electronically have, but I think it just really depends on your own specific overhead and how much you've invested into what you're doing. Now, what I think is super interesting about what you're saying is that you find your membership to be a big revenue driver in all of your digital products. So I just did a workshop yesterday teaching people how to start memberships because I get to see the back end of my literary cart. And what I see is that the people who are making the most money are the ones who have memberships because of the recurring revenue, because you're not going, well, it's it's the summer and people aren't necessarily i got to i got to really be marketing because this isn't the time when people are buying if they're in your membership and you keep them happy and you create this sense of community and a reason to stay that just boom you know you're making money you can rely on that revenue yeah yeah for for sure and and uh and in addition like those are all customers you don't have to spend money to keep like getting your class in front of you know it's not even just a matter of attracting new customers it's like you know those are now people who like you're not paying to like remarket to in any way and it's like to me it just it also makes things like easier Mm -hmm. i love that i love that okay so for the food blogger who is obsessed with keyword research, who's obsessed with like Google and making money on their ads and stuff. And we talked about this, like I feel like things are changing and shifting, especially with AI. If you were to give somebody advice to say, go try this, go start this, what would you say? Like, what are some of the shortcuts that you would say, hey, here's how to get started. Here's how to do this. All right, so from from like a kind of technical perspective on like how to set up a class, that, that's I think something that's intimidating to people, right? Like thinking you really need like a massively elaborate setup. Um, you you can do things pretty simply, you know. Like I've seen some cooking classes that are like somebody just teaching it with a laptop, but I mean, food bloggers, you guys already have like legit DSLRs with good lenses and stuff. And it's a matter of having some type of capture card that can like allow the HDMI output of your camera to go into your computer. You know, like um, I use a thing called the ATEM Mini, um, which is a switcher that allows me to have like up to four cameras hooked up. And then like as I'm teaching, I'll have it next to my cutting board and I just like hit a button to like show the students, you know, my top down shot of my cutting board or what's on the stove. Like you can make it super fancy if you want, or you could like hook up a few iPhones to that with like a lightning to HDMI dongle and some app on your your iPhone to like 
be able to get a clean HDMI output. And if you don't believe this is possible, go back and listen to my episode. I think it's 294 with Natasha from Natasha's Home, where she did a super simple workshop teaching gluten-free baking. She made hundreds of dollars and it wasn't hard. And in fact, her main criticism was she left a dish towel in the back of her shot. And she did it all with, I think, her iPhone. And she used my lottery cart to collect payments. She used my launch calendar just to get it up. I think she's now done two or three more workshops. And just like you, she recorded them live and sells the replays as courses. Now, I want to talk about your vibe. Like, you have a very strong delightful personality. And my hunch is people come back because of that. So how do you recommend somebody imbue themselves who are, let's say, like, I believe food bloggers like to hide behind their blogs. I just make pretty, pretty, pretty food. I take, you know, nice pictures. And there is this added piece of like, oh, wait, you want me to show up and talk to people? Well, you know, to, to like, connect this back to what you were saying about the difficulty that arises with like artificial intelligence generated stuff starting to flood the internet like this is what sets you apart from the sea of noise like if you can be comfortable being yourself in front of other people and like sharing some of your unique perspectives on stuff and like even making mistakes in front of other people that like show them it's okay to not be perfect all the time. Uh, This is like the connection people really crave that they're never going to get out of artificial intelligence. And, you know, it's look, it's not for everybody being in front of a camera and and speaking to students and stuff like that. Um, It it's taken me years of like, you know, teaching at culinary schools and being on TV shows and what have you to feel just like natural and comfortable. And there, you know, like my wife had to teach a cooking class during the pandemic. Um, we got a grant for our synagogue through this this uh, thing called Shemayim, which is like a initi- It's an initiative to like bring vegan food into synagogues. And, you know, she just did it like on her laptop with her like laptops built in camera and she did a great job. Like she's not like doing anything super, super fancy with it, but like she did it and people got stuff out of it and you've got to start somewhere with it, you know, and and that's the thing, like people stop themselves from doing a lot of things because they're waiting for it to be like polished and perfect and flawless and, you know, like as as creative people, like, I think we all have to accept, like, we're always going to like do things better in the future. Like I look at my cookbook that I published, like whatever, seven or eight years ago now. And I'm like, man, I could do so much better now, but you got to do what you can do. You know, like I can, if I can do something better now, I should write another cookbook now, you know, and that's how we like grow as creative people. It's funny. Um, I was sharing, I was sharing with you that I just got off a call this morning with a woman who purchased my electric card and she is a, she's like a health food person helping mm -hmm. like menopausal women. And our whole conversation was all about you. Like, she's like, I'm not a marketer. And I'm like, okay, but guess what? You've got you've got a problem that you are solving for people and you've got to get that solution out there. It doesn't matter if you're a marketer, like, and, and all I kept telling her is go poke at the pain of the women who you can help to say, I can help you like that's your job. So in the same way, um, she was holding herself back going like, I'm not a marketer. I hate social media. The whole thing I go, it's not about that. It's about, can you show up for somebody and help them. And I feel like you tap into that and create this like positive vibe. And that's what you're providing. So in a weird way, it's like we get so caught up in ourselves and our own insecurities and people are going to judge us. And what you're saying is go start, go put it out there, go attract the people that you can help. Yeah. And, and like, ultimately you attract the people you like want to attract too, you know, like, by being your authentic goofy self 
you'll you'll attract people who like accept you for who you are mm -hmm. not like people who like are looking for some like star tv human to teach them how to do stuff and that that just makes your own life so much more pleasant like that you get to serve people who like are okay with you being you you know that's that's nice Absolutely. So, but I think that we see the world like through our own eyes and we get so caught up in the perfection, in the judgment, in that. And when we can shift the camera, shift the angle and be focused on, hey, I know this thing and I can be helpful and I can be human and I can be goofy and all of this and I can lighten somebody else's load. Like why, like yeah. you've got an obligation to do that, to put that out there. That was my whole conversation of, it's not about you. It's that it doesn't matter like what your tech looks like. It will be rough in the beginning, but go do it. Yeah. I mean, your, your audience, I think to a degree has like a head start on that because they're food bloggers, right? Like food bloggers have to already accept like, Hey, like I know there's like other people who have like degrees who make this cookie, but this is like my cookie recipe. And I'm going to share it and like accept that some people are going to love it. And that's cool. You know, like, um, so people who are like food bloggers already have like a little bit of a jump on like accepting their own imperfections and just like putting out the best thing they can put out, you know, like that's, that's awesome. That's a lot easier to like make that jump to something else, like teaching classes or writing a cookbook because they're already like, you know, empowered to create something on their own. Hmm. I really like that. Now, what about your business in terms of digital products? Are you most excited and where are you growing in that way? Um, so yeah, like my membership has, I, I actually only rolled out my membership maybe about a year ago. Uh, before then it was all just like, uh, you know, kind of a la carte sales. And that's just like given my family a lot more of a cushion as as the months kind of fluctuate um and you know it's as i've attracted more traffic to my blog like some percentage of those people end up converting into you know people who are on my membership and that that just helps a lot um where i'm i'm looking to go with that kind of next is like getting a little bit more granular with like what classes I put in front of what kind of visitors to my blog. And there's there's a plugin that I don't know if it came out yet or if it's still in beta that I've been messing with. It's called the Dynamic Connector Block by, I want to say they're called like tiny plugins or small plugins. It's like a small plugin maker. And what it is, is it's a dynamic block that you can have show different content according to like what category somebody is looking at on your blog, right? So say somebody's looking at like an Indian recipe on my blog, I can have like a little block somewhere in my blog post that's like, I have a class on Sattvic Indian food. You want to like check that out here? You can like buy it right here. Like, you know, if somebody's Ooh. looking at like a dessert class, I can have like that block show them a thing for like my donut making class or some dessert making class, you know? And so just kind of like an email list is like kind of curating the content that's most like pertinent to where somebody's at in their journey with you, right? And And that's a nice thing to like continue to hone and get better. You know, like same with your email list. If somebody signs up, and they're like only into gluten-free food, but you do food that's also not gluten-free, like by shoving everything down their throat, they're like not getting a whole lot of value out of it. But if you like just give them kind of what they're looking for, it's it's super helpful to them. They're more likely to like stay on your list and convert into being a customer in some way. And it's that's kind of the way I'm trying to think about stuff now is like really refining my process so that like people get what's really the best for them and what they're going to enjoy the most and what they're going to learn the most from. And wait, I have to share something that you shared with me that was so shocking. You are a food blogger and you are not monetizing with ads. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's true. Yeah. But I monetize like with primarily with like my classes and stuff and, and that does pretty well, you know, like 
it, it ebbs and flows, but like I could have a month where I do like $10,000 in like class sales and stuff. And for me, as that being just like one component of how I make my living is great. You know, like if that was everything to me, it would still be okay. But like, if that's just like the cherry on top of me doing pop-ups and catering and culinary consulting and stuff, like it's, it's great. Nice. Well, I have to yeah. say, Adam, if people want to see what you're doing, learn more about you, connect with you, what's the best place? So I'm at cinnamonsnail.com. That's the name of my like food truck and business and stuff. And yeah, I've got all kinds of resources on there. Like, and it might be interesting for some of your listeners to check out just like how I present that information. If they're thinking about doing a similar thing, like they can head over to my like courses page and sort of see the way I laid that all out and just learn about all the wacky stuff I do. That's what, and you could use something like my Logic cart for payments to set this whole thing up. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, Adam, I have to say, this has been incredibly delightful. You have given me a super ridiculously good time. Again, yippee skippy, and it was a hullabaloo of a razzle-dazzle delight. I hope you guys like this episode. I thought Adam was truly delightful, and I was so impressed with how willing he was to share and how he says you got to start somewhere, and the more human you are, the better. And if you're already a food blogger, you have so many advantages. There's no reason not to try this. If you're ready to start, but it feels a little intimidating, just get on a call with me, and I'll walk you through it. MiloTree.com slash meat because I would love to meet you. You're ready to start selling digital products. Go check out Milo Tree Cart at milotree.com. And remember, there's no risk to try it because we offer a 30-day, no questions asked, money back guarantee. And I will see you here again next week.